Welcome to The Photographer Show, where we talk to you, the everyday photographers in the photo, fo photo focus community, about your love of photography and dig into some of the fun, nerdy stuff we all love about the art and craft of photography. My name is Scott Wynkiewicz, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Lori Novak. Hey, Lori. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Good, good, good. Awesome. So the Photographer Show is presented by Tamron. Be sure to check out instant savings on select Tamron lenses for your DSLR or mirrorless camera. Go to tamron-usa.com. And today we are talking with Mike Rhino. Mike, uh, welcome to the Photographer Show. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me on. I appreciate it. So I'm a uh, photographer. I live in uh, Highlands Ranch, Colorado, just a little bit outside of Denver. And uh, as far as my photography, I began uh, taking photographs about five years ago with a real camera. That's when I got my first uh, first camera, Nikon. And uh, what originally I got that for the purpose of uh, going up and uh, capturing some of the images that I would come across while doing other outdoor activities, which include hiking, fly fishing, and that in our local mountains. Um, so since then, I've been, you know, initially I went ahead and... Uh, wanted to learn more about how to use the camera, so I joined a local camera club that I've been involved with for the past five years, currently the president of the Lone Tree Photography Club, and also have really enjoyed, uh, you know, other communities and so forth similar to this one that uh, have really provided great opportunities for uh, moving my uh, photography along. So currently what I do most is um, landscape, nature, wildlife photography, but I'm also always very interested in learning uh, some of the other genres, macro photography, and just now I'm trying to learn a little bit more about the, the people and portrait type photography. Yeah, I noticed, I, I mentioned this to Lori uh, yesterday or, or over the weekend, I can't remember, that uh, while, while choosing which photos that I wanted to share with the viewers and have you talk about, mm -hmm. I noticed how diverse that your, that your work is. You, you've definitely... Um, have your share of of wildlife and and um, and landscapes and, and things like that, and it's really nice to see um, each of which are really good. You know, like um, there 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 are photographers out there that that try to spread themselves thin, doing a whole bunch of things, and you can see there's there's areas that are lacking. You know, from different genres where um, everything you're doing is just really good across the board. Um, so it's really nice and refreshing to see yeah. that. I'm just, you said you've only been doing this for five years. That's, that's uh -huh. like, that's amazing. Oh, and, you and, never, and, did you ever have, you know, shoot before or ever? Oh, it's a great question. So, I mean, just growing up as a child, I always had the little, uh, it was like the Kodak pocket instamatic camera. And X that is what I started with. <laughs> and, and then, and, and when I say I got a, a real camera, I got, you know, a, a Nikon, like, you know, a Digital, guitar, yeah. um, you know, five years ago. But before that, you know, obviously experimented a little bit with the, uh, you know, the, the iPhone can't, you know, shots or whatever and so forth. Um, and then uh, also had, um, uh, you know, the point and shoot camera. So I, so I can't say that I started completely day, you know, five years ago that that was the first shot I ever took. But that was when I first became uh, a little bit more serious. And, and, and to Scott's point, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. You know, I know a lot of people would say or you know, get the advice to try and specialize in one or two things, but I just have too much fun. As, as I learn one, at, <laughs> one, I'll say genre, there's always something else that I see from somebody else that's like, I wonder how they did that. How do they get that light? How do they get that, that to work? And then um, that's, that's what keeps it interesting to me is there's always so much more to learn. And I think when you, that, when you are learning photography, like I think that you shoot everything in the beginning, you know, and mm -hmm. your beginning might be a year, could be 10 years. You're still trying to figure out what it is you want to do. And sometimes people just want to shoot whatever they want to shoot. They're not trying to do anything in particular and that's okay. Right. right. You know, we yeah. get, we get kind of people saying you should pick one thing. And I'm like, I can't pick one thing, you know, yeah, I, and I, I don't I, think I, you I, should I, have to. Yeah. Unless you're trying to make money off of one thing, then maybe you should focus on that. But right. You right. know, like you said, there's always something to learn. I'm taking a macro class right now. It's totally not, you know, architecture. It's completely different, you know. It yeah, I was I, a lot more patience and it's just different yeah. for me. I, I was about to say that uh, when it comes to my 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 own work, um, I'm kind of in the same boat with the macro photography. Like I could do portraits, I can do landscapes, cityscapes, street photography. I love it. 
Mm-hmm. You give me, I have a macro lens. I typically use it for headshots, but you, you make me do a macro. I'm just like, what, what do I do with this? Like I, yeah. you know, it's out of my element, but, um, it's one of those things where you, you have to try it. If you have the equipment, you have to try whatever is out of your element to get better. So, um, and doing those things help yeah. you in your other, in your normal or what you generally shoot. You yeah. know, if I shoot yeah. a lot of architecture doing macro, makes me think more about some of the details in the architecture than I would normally yeah. maybe, you know, if there's always something you can learn yeah. from what you're learning that you can apply to every other genre. And, and that's exactly, yeah, yeah I, I would make the same point is that again, as I've been doing this for, you know, like I say over the last five years, and as I try one type versus the other, I do find that, that there's the complementary uh, aspects of it that exactly as you're saying is that uh, as I do some of the other, even if it's portrait or if it's macro and so forth and that, it makes me a little bit more observant and so forth when I go out and do my landscape photography. So it helps me with my mm-hmm. compositions and what I'm trying to capture yeah. in that. It, it, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, cross back and forth in that. But um, it, 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 again, part of why I like to uh, experiment with the various uh, things. Macro being one of those. I think mean, you mentioned that, um, <laughs> you know, Tamron was one of the span- sponsors. I have that. The only macro lens I had mm-hmm. is the, uh, the Tamron 90. It's 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 fun mm-hmm. to go out and play around with that one, especially this time of year when the flowers start showing up. Yeah, you know, and it, um, one of the, one great way to learn about aperture is by doing macro photography because there's no better way to really understand how aperture makes a difference on your photos than by doing a close up of a flower or a bug or whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, so you mentioned that your first DSLR was a Nikon camera. What? camera are you currently using today? Yeah, so I've stayed with the uh, Nikon family. The first one was a Nikon uh, D3300, which is you know, um, you know, kind of an entry-level camera. So the ones that I'm using right now, I've got a couple of primary ones that I use, uh, actually three. The, the Nikon D850, so that's a full-frame uh, mm-hmm. camera. And then also a, a, the newer one that I have is the Z72, so that is the mirrorless camera. Nice. So I'm just starting to get into the uh, the mirrorless world. And then I will add one other one that I have in there too, that um, I had some uh, uh, encouragement to uh, experiment with in that, and that is uh, infrared. So I had got a Nikon Z5, which nice. also is a mirrorless camera, got that converted for uh, infra- in- infrared, and uh, have really enjoyed uh, going out and experimenting with that one. It's been kind of a, a new passion for me to see that get back. I'm surprised you took a new camera body to do the infrared conversion instead of doing your D3300 yep. as the infrared conversion. Right, right, right. And, and you know, I thought about that and I talked to a couple people. Part of what it is, is I don't know how familiar you are with the, the infrared, but there is a benefit to mirrorless in that whenever you go mm-hmm. the uh, mirrorless route, you're not locked into just, say, one lens. If you get a camera converted, typically if it's just the uh, DSLR, you have a specific lens that you get it size to and um, uh, I'll say focused to whereas if you're using the mirrorless I'm not sure exactly why this is but you have the ability to interchange the existing lenses that you have so it was mostly that yeah well it's yeah that's that's the whole um, phase detection for focus and things like that where uh, with the DSLR you need to calibrate your your lenses I mean no matter what whether it's infrared or not with a mirrorless you don't have to calibrate your lenses um, just due to the science behind the technology so um when it comes to infrared it's just it's it, it is a benefit of course to um to go the mirrorless routes because you don't have to worry about any calibration at all ever that's, really <laughs> that, that, that's what it is so yeah thank you for uh, adding that yeah. but that's but that was yeah. the reason why i went ahead and literally i got a new one i, I had a trip planned up to um uh wyoming to uh, the grand teton national park and i wanted nice. to get i wanted to go up there with infrared so literally i got the camera sent it in had it converted got it back like two days before my trip and that was kind of where i initiated the that it's been fun nice I enjoy I, doing that, awesome. too. Mm-hmm. that that's a great location to do infrared too uh, yeah I, that's yeah. my favorite place of everywhere on, on earth that i've been that's my favorite so far <laughs> yeah and that was my first time there but yeah it was uh, it was october of last year so so this next question uh, is one that Lori thought of uh, last week. What obstacles have you overcome in your photography? Mm. 
couple of obstacles that I'm trying to still work through. The biggest one, I think we all deal with this one, uh, especially if we're working full time elsewhere and so forth, is it really is the time element. And, you know, it, it, it's with a full time job, it's trying to find time to go out and, you know, I, go out, you know, say even on the weekends or, you know, go out for an extended period. We all have, you know, if you're working a, say, a five day a week job, you still have other commitments, other obligations, and that to take care over the weekend. So the short answer of it is is time. So um, I'm working on uh, creating more of that for myself, so I can dedicate more of that towards photography in the very near future. Awesome. That's the biggest option. Nice. Yeah. So what was the uh, hardest thing to learn in your photography journey so far? You know, I think um, a lot of times it's, uh, I, I would say, patience in, in that, you know, whenever I go out, I mean, when I, at least when I first, you know, start was starting with photography and that, and, and again, landscapes was, you know, what I was most interested in, you know, I, I go out and immediately go to, uh, you know, say some of the scenes that are, you know, popular, kind of some of the iconic locations and so forth, and you try and get every everything that you can out of, out of those places or whatever and that you try and time it with the right light and so forth. But, you know, I, I think as, as time has gone on, I've become a little bit more patient with, you know, not necessarily just going out and looking for the same scenes that other people shoot frequently and so forth, but more kind of going out and without maybe a, as much of a preconceived, this is what I want to come back with, but becoming more patient, looking for the light, looking for, what direction there's the right clouds or whatever. All of a sudden it may not be the scene that I went out there to look for initially wanted to go out and capture, but coming back with something um, unique and, uh, and that. So I think I, if, if that answers the question, it, it's you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, I guess patience and looking for the right light rather than just going out and trying to force that. Right. Yeah. You know, there's, Going to, for example, going to Grand Teton National Park, you want to get one of those iconic photos. You know, if you're only there for two days, there's a chance you may not get it. You know, you, you have to wait for the perfect light and it has to be the perfect time in order for you to get the exact photo that you want. And um, I think that is a, a, a really big learning process to understand that that things aren't just magic. Um, there's more to it than just being at the right place. It's being at the right place at the right time with the right conditions. There's a lot, there's a lot involved. And, 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 that, um, and that's where the patience comes in. And, and yeah. the other part of that, that that goes hand in hand with that is when you go there and the conditions aren't what you want, what you saw in some other great image from somebody else who's at that iconic locations when conditions were ideal. Now it's a matter of, okay, well, these are the conditions that I have been provided to me. How can I make the most of that? How can I make the best? Right, and find something else yeah. that will work. Right. Right. right, right, right. So that's which is part of what makes it fun. That's it, it's the creative creativity part of it, as opposed to going out. And if it, it was always going out and there's magical light and you come back with a pristine shot every single time, it would kind of probably take a little, a little bit away from it. So I want to take a short break to remind everybody that PhotoFocus has launched its own community. Head over to photofocus.com and click on the community link in the menu to join exclusive conversations and events. And with that, uh, we have one more question before we dive into the four photos we're going to be looking at from your portfolio today. Um, so my last question for you right now is what is, uh, I mentioned earlier that Grand Teton is actually my favorite location of all the places <laughs> I've ever been. What is your location? Because uh, looking at your at your work, you've been in a lot of places. Um, so, what is your favorite location of all the places that you have photographed? Got to pick one, huh? Ah, just right. one. Okay, <laughs> I, oh, I want to rattle off about ten. Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna kind of uh, because I'm in Colorado and because it's I don't want to say in my backyard, but it's not far away. I I, I really enjoy because I can do it as a day trip or a weekend trip or whatever. Is uh, Rocky Mountain National Park? There's some mm -hmm. other <laughs> southern. Colorado locations that I love also, but, um, so if I, if I have to pick one, it's, uh, I, I don't want to go that route. So, so we'll go and say, um, Rocky Mountain National Park. I like the trails there. I like the, um, there, there's various, you know, some of the iconic locations there, uh, in the park and that, but I also like to just go there and, you know, one, as I mentioned, sort of what got me into photography was the uh, outdoor activities, the hiking, the fly fishing and that, and, that is a location that I can go and bring my fly fishing rod, bring my hiking boots, 
And of course, the camera now is a, a re real big element of that trip also. But I'm going to go ahead and um, say Rocky Mountain National Park is the number one. So I've been to, to Colorado and specifically the Denver area, I think three times at this point. And the one time that I had the opportunity to go to Rocky Mountain National Park and take some photos, which I didn't have much time there, but the one time I was there, we saw somebody fly fishing. <laughs> so okay. I think it, it, it's, it's funny because it's, it's like that is something you think about. Um, at least from, so, uh, so I'm in New Jersey, and mm -hmm. even as somebody that's not from Colorado, when I think of Rocky Mountain National Park, I think, you know, beautiful sky, beautiful mountain, beautiful water, and fly fishing in the in the park. Right. I don't know why I do, but I do. <laughs> and, and I got to witness it firsthand the only time I was there. I thought it was like, you know, just one of those um, perfect, uh, the, the earth aligned perfectly. Like the advertising for me, so. moment. Sure, sure. Right. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, so we are going to dive right in to four photos of yours mm -hmm. and the first one. So if you can share, um, you know, what made you stop to, to, to capture this image? Um, what was your setup like um, post-processing? Mm -hmm. What did you do as far as that goes? Sure, um, all those sure. fun things. Uh, for me, I, I, I like to share like what caught my attention from yeah. from in your portfolio, because obviously you've got a lot of work in there. And so I was browsing and browsing and I picked out the ones that stood out like first, right? Then to me, uh, this one, I, I've got, I've got a thing for sunflowers and there's something about, um, something eerie in a way, uh, that's very human like of a whole bunch of sunflowers standing and staring at you in the face. <laughs> so that's the exact, that's that's the, that was the feeling I got when I looked at this. I said, that is a lot of like alien sunflowers looking at me. And um, so it caught my attention. And as you can see in the photo, it goes on and on and on. It's just an endless field of sunflowers. So um, yeah, that's what caught my attention of this. So if you can I share. One. The one in the front, I love that. Sure, sure, sure. So so yeah, this, this scene was a couple of years ago. Um, out here, uh, literally, when you said you flew into Denver, when you were at that airport, you were only about maybe two or three miles from this location. Um, there, there are several sunflower fields out there. Uh, and this for this one, I was out on the outer perimeter to, to it. And I want to point that out, too, only because over the last couple of years, they've had some issues with people coming out and going out and wandering into. And these, again, are fields. These are a crop for whoever you know owns that property and so forth and that. So... I do want to point out the importance of staying on the outskirts, whether it be the road, staying uh, outside of the, the private property. So now I'll go into the, the, the photo is that I was out on the outer perimeter with that. Uh, I believe so, some of these I took with a uh, Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter lens and some with a 24 to 70. And this one might have been with 24 to 70, but probably opened out to 24 millimeters. And uh, I know that, so I was out there and taking some images as the sun was setting and wanted to make sure that right as the sun caught the horizon, that I tried to get a little bit of that sun flare on it. So I went with an F16 as the aperture to kind of, again, when you do that, you get that little bit of that, that sun flare that's out there. And, you know, but then at the same time, trying to get as much as I could in focus. So I tried to you know, focus, I think, probably a third into the scene and that just so that the, the front flowers would be in focus. Um, you mentioned that uh, it looks like those flowers go on forever. They go on pretty far, but, you know, back behind, right about at the back end of that horizon and that there's probably another road back in there. And then it turns into, um, well, an airport is just to the left of that scene. And uh, there's some other complexes in out there. So, I was able to at least kind of do it where I didn't have to Photoshop any of that kind of stuff out of there. All, all of that was natural, but there are, there are other things on the other side of those flowers. One being the city of Denver. <laughs> and, that, and that's the other thing. That's another thing that's so great about um, the Colorado is how diverse uh, just the land is. You know, mm -hmm. you wouldn't think that there's going to be a field of sunflowers right next to an airport. It just, yeah. it doesn't make sense, right. but it's there. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know? like I said, this is literally two or three miles from the airport. And um, uh, let's see, and, and it's about, you know, they, so they grow them over the course of the summer, but it's right around early August is the time that they 
sort of reach this peak where they're up at that higher level where the flowers are uh, pretty fully in bloom. And if you wait too long, like a week after this, it, it, they, they start to wilt and um, fade away and get harvested. And that's where sunflower oil and other things come from. That was going to be my next question, if you, is if you knew that if these were like, you know, made into food and, and whatnot, or if they were, uh, you know, sold to, because there's, there's sunflower fields here in New Jersey, but they're mostly like, go buy, you know, pick them and, and buy them and bring them home. It, it's less than, more so than like, it's not a crop. Them. Basically, yeah. 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 yeah I was going to, I was going to say, I didn't even. Um, so I believe that uh, these ones, they don't necessarily go into like stores for sale for like floral arrangements and that sort of thing. It's, it's pretty much a, a crop for, like I say, some type of food. I don't know that it's necessarily like, say, the sunflower seeds that come in the, the packets that you eat, but I believe they go into mm-hmm. you know, the sunflower oils and, and some of those kind of things. Iconic, mm-hmm. iconic bird. Um, and the what really caught my attention more than anything else is the uh, perfect timing of this, right? I mean, it's it's like it's um, almost as one of those like birds over water, the right when you catch the bird, you know, catching a fish, uh, that type of view. You, you know that bird's going in for a landing, uh, and you you basically captured, you know, her landing perfectly. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. So, 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 so I, have, I, have, I have to, I have a confession on this one here. So, so while I wish this was like a hundred percent in the wild, this is, I you know, came across it and, and, and timed it that way. So this was at a um, event with our um, uh, club that uh, where this, and, and I do have some other Eagle pictures, by the way, that I have captured in the wild in flight and, you know, doing their, doing their own thing. But this one here, they it, you know was a little bit staged, and that there was somebody who and and it's a, a it's a bird um, rescue uh, firm and so forth and that's but they also do you know take their birds out and allow you to photograph them and that. But the reality is is that they did have it out there on you know that it, it's not trained to do this necessarily, but they um, they had it you know fly from somebody's hand over to this uh, tree stump and they had that that set up. But like I say. Um, I, I did. I, I still did have to get my camera settings right and so forth and that. So I made sure that I went with a, yeah. you know, a, a, a pretty wide open aperture. I think I went like a four, if I remember right. And what I did was made sure that I had my shutter speed was my uh, the, the thing that I was really making sure that I was focused on at least one one thousandth of a second and so forth, so that I could get it sharp. But um, like I said, I, I wish I could say that this was caught in the wild. Got other eagle <laughs> pictures that are are caught in the wild, but this one I did have. Um, it was at an event that was. Um, it's a good way to practice, though. It's sure. a good way yeah. to practice doing doing bird photography like that. Did yeah, you yeah. shoot this in burst mode, or did you? Okay. It, it, it was. I, I took about three shots in its flight. I didn't. I didn't just hold the shutter okay. down and, and let it go. First, I took right. three in in succession as it was coming through. Okay. Um, and and this was That's awesome. And, and, and so, Lori, so you mentioned that this is, you know, a good learning opportunity. So this was actually right. in my first year of the five years of photography is that this was in that first year. And so to your point, you know, I, I, in, in attending an event like that, learning how to get the camera settings, learning how to, um, to do this. It, it wasn't a, a workshop in that we didn't have an instructor there. So I it still are on your own in terms of getting those camera settings and in terms of, um, you know, getting the right exposure and so forth. So, so that part of it was all on my own, but in taking what I learned and doing some of this, it has helped me in my, I'll say wildlife photography when I go out looking for the camera settings and so forth, when I am amongst, um, you know, birds, eagles, elk, whatever it might be out in the, in the wild. So. I mean, it, it goes to show that, that, um, you know, learning experiences like this, even if it's a pre-set up situation, um, one, not only are you learning, and if you if you if you get the shutter speed wrong, obviously that photo wouldn't be as effective. But there, even in a pre-set up situation, there's still photos that you could wind up using mm-hmm. um, in your in your work. There's no reason why you couldn't. Um, I, I, I a few years ago, I, I hosted a a, a a headshot workshop where we set up. I think it was two or three scenes. 
and we basically just worked headshots of each other. And we, we basically all agreed, like, we can use it in our portfolios. It's, we did the work. Right. It's just, it was all pre-set up for, you know, we set it up our, all together. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, but we still had to, you know, choose our aperture, choose our shutter, choose our, our ISO, choose our focus. You know, we picked what lighting gels we want to use and what backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so learning experiences can still be used. Um, there's no harm in it. And um, the most important part about them is that you learn something from it. <laughs> so, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yep. All right. Let's look to the next one. So uh, I think it's quite obvious what caught my attention on this one. I love this sort of just it's a lovey-dovey moment. Um, and uh, yeah, my guess, uh, I, th I think I pulled this from your Colorado, uh, yep. one of your Col Colorado um, galleries. But uh, right. You know, it's just one of those moments that, you know, if you, you would see the same thing on one of those uh, planet Earth, you know, uh, <laughs> shows or whatever that where where the uh, they're they're just, you know, you can tell it's the animal love. Uh, so, yeah, I, I love this one. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. And, th and thank you for pulling this one. Uh, um, it, so when I mentioned earlier and you you hit the uh, the location right when you said Colorado. And when I mentioned earlier that uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is, is, again, I guess, number one in terms of my uh, destinations in that one, uh, that it's local enough that I can do as a, as a day trip. And that's exactly what this one was, is I went there in the morning, not expecting this, but um, I went there to uh, photograph one of the lakes there and uh, arrived probably a half hour, 45 minutes before sunrise. It was a really early, uh, I want to say probably September morning, maybe August or September it's been September, just looking at the, the size of their um, antlers and that. So arrived there and was photographing the, um, the lake just as the sun was rising. And along comes one of those elk actually walked into the lake and was walking towards me. And then it got up on the shore. And then along comes this other. And these are both large male bull elk. Um, the other one came in from over on the side. And they kind of migrated over to each other and they got close enough. The, the thing is, is with these elk, they can be dangerous if you get too close to them. I had a 70 to 200 yep. lens yeah. and this would have been all the way out at 200 millimeters. But just kind of the direction they were walking a bit towards me, I actually had to back up to get the shot only because I didn't want to get within, you know, they say stay at least 25 <laughs> yards away from them or whatever in that. And, they were moving towards me, and I'm backing up as I'm trying to get this shot. Um, you know, I, I, I and, and I think I opened up the aperture as, as far as I could, trying to blur that background, but um, that was the only thing. I, I wish that the, the background could be a little bit cleaner, but the sun was coming off coming off to the right, and um, so you can get a little bit of that, uh, the, the light that's hitting the, the antlers in, in a certain direction. But all of a sudden, when they started, kind of as you were describing, and they kind of came together, and I, I didn't know, you know, the, later on, like in about a month after this, they would go into what they call doing a rut, where they, you know, butt heads and try and knock each other's antlers off or whatever and that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> at this stage, it's, they still have a lot of that velvet on the antlers, and they were still in a, a friendly mode, which which I was glad to see. You know, you mentioned uh, the background and you wish it would be cleaner. In a way, it's kind of cool the fact that the tree branches have the same geometric craziness like the antlers, right? They're these, these random lines going in different directions. And um, so it actually goes well. Sure, it would be neat if, if it was more blurred, but, um, but I think it's kind of fun, the fact that it all just sort of plays well together it still works sure. it, it puts a little bit of texture oh no, sorry. that's okay i was gonna say it still works and then the the way that the antlers are lit it really defines them right. so that makes yeah. them pop off the background as well right it was a fun morning yeah that's awesome. elk, elk are, so these were these were uh i know um elk could be pretty tall with these how tall do you think these were yeah they were as, as at least as tall as me meaning like the shoulders of them yeah. were up uh, so that would be six foot, call it six one, something like that. Somewhere yeah. in that six foot range would be up to the back. And then if you, you know, those antlers are getting to the point where they're not quite full grown, but pretty high, but you know, they're a couple feet on top of them with those, uh, with 
the antlers. Beautiful. Yeah, it, it could be it could be intimidating at times, especially if they're if they're coming at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, like I said, I was, I was I was backing away. I've I've been out there too when moose have kind of started approaching me, and those are the other ones that you want to back away from. Also, yeah. So. They're 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 even bigger, I think, right? Moose are pretty right. Yeah, they're 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 bigger and certainly heavier. But both of them are size. I think the elk will get into the five six hundred pound range or whatever, whereas the moose will get um, maybe a thousand pounds kind of thing. Yeah. We when I was in Grand Teton, I saw one moose uh, the entire time. I saw one, but um, and then one of our one of the. the the photographers I was with in that trip, we saw, uh, he saw, I didn't get to see it, saw a bear across one of the lakes uh, having its way with a fish. And uh, <laughs> oh, I think it was a fish. oh, wow. And he, okay. caught, he caught that one. But um, I, think wow. I, I think I was sleeping when he went out for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, I see, it's, it's, interestingly, I haven't, I haven't seen very many bears out here. I've seen a couple of them as much times as I spend out in the wild. I, I, I think the story is probably, I haven't seen them. That many bears, just a handful. There's probably dozens of bears that have seen me. Right. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, but at, 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 at Teton, I saw one bear, but it was really tucked into the trees. It wasn't one of the grizzlies. It was a black bear. But um, uh, but yeah, bear encounters. I guess maybe I should be glad that I haven't come across too many. Yeah. I would like to get yeah. more of them on the camera, but um, at the same time, I'm not there in the wild. I'm, I'm okay if I come back and don't see them. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Um, so the last photo, uh, also Colorado, um, now mm -hmm. the, besides from the beautiful color and the, and the fun, you know, sort of, uh, sort of bean like shape in from the center. Um, one thing that, that, uh, caught my attention the most, uh, which is completely unrelated to photography in itself is that my in-laws are about to go out to Denver for, um, uh, mm -hmm. for a wedding for a family member's wedding. Mm -hmm. And, um, my father-in-law was asking me, where should I go see? And, where should I go? and so he's actually on his list is to go to union station just to, this, oh, it's right. a, you know, obvious, as you can see, it's a beautiful, beautiful location. So, um, that's what caught my attention. I actually shared uh, a couple of your union station photos with him so he can see what he's about to get himself into. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. 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 Um, I thought, no, I, I thought this would be a yeah. good one to, to end, um, you know, uh, your photos with because it's a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's, um, uh, and, and again, thank you for selecting this one. It's, it's, it is one that I enjoy and I, and I've been to this location several times. Um, and I, so when I mentioned, you know, I do, you know, different genres. One thing I really do enjoy is whenever I have the opportunity to get up downtown, downtown Denver, this, this location is, uh, just walk around with a camera and look for different scenes, different, um, uh, you know, it, it, di di different things that are up, down there, and so forth. Just the way the light hits certain areas and that, and and one of the things that I've missed during this, I guess, you know, COVID, the pandemic, and so forth, is usually my commute is to and from downtown Denver. That's usually where I'm working my corporate job, and so I, I always, and this, and that was the case here, is that I will take my camera with me for, um, uh, and you know, especially. Like in the morning, sometimes I'm arriving up downtown right around sunrise or just before, just after or whatever and so forth. And so I would always carry my camera with me to work and uh, and sometimes just a little portable tripod and that. And so that's what I had here. And so this one here actually was, I believe this one was caught in the evening. So this would have been on my commute back and I can catch you know, the light rail system out here in um, Colorado, which is where this... And, you know, it goes to and from uh, Union Station. So I would always kind of, whenever I would arrive to work or go home, I would um, often make a stop somewhere within here. There's a lot of different um, uh, scenes at this location, but this is one that I particularly like, just the, the shapes and the, the lines and the design and that of the, this Union Station. And again, you can see that back there, the building, it gives you the name of, of where I'm at. But... Um, but just the the, 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 the new design, this, I think they put this in probably five, six, seven years ago, something like that, as mm -hmm. far as this brand new Union Station. And um, it's a fun place to go out there with the camera. But having said that, that, this is one of the things that I've missed over this last however many months we're into this, 16 months or something like that, is 
that commute always was a big reason for me to get downtown and a big reason for me to um, get some of my cityscape photos. And I don't have as many of those here over the last 16 months. Yeah, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so working work, working from home has been nice, not having to commute, right? I don't right. have the, I'll say, hour-long commute back and forth if I factor in the time of being on the light rail and, and so forth. But what I do miss is the, the, the city, the scenes, and everything that goes on up there. And that. So um, I'll, I'll get back out there. See. All right. So you should see me again. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have one more question for you before we wrap up. Lori, do you have any questions that you want to get in? No, just, uh, you know, when I come out there, will you take me there? Because that's yeah, just, I yeah, have to go yeah. there. <laughs> so so, in, so it's, anybody... amazing, it's an amazing structure. You could spend all day shooting that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And I, I know, Lori, you, yeah. Lori, I know you have some amazing <laughs> shots of um, of Chicago and other cities and so forth in that. And, and, and so so having said that with the cityscape, you know, Denver does have its own skyline and it's got its yeah. own different vantage points or whatever in that. And I can show you uh, exactly where I was and or any of the others in the community and that if they're out, I can you know, give instructions or if I'm available, go out and uh, show you where some of these Time to start are. traveling again. Mm -hmm. Right. Definitely right. time mm -hmm. to start traveling again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, uh, uh, just a quick thing, let me go back to that real quick. Um, I actually wonder, just if you look at the shape of this, and um, I, I don't know if, you, if you've been to New York City lately in the past few years, but there's a new uh, subway station by... Uh, sort of by um, the Freedom Tower, and it's called Oculus. And I actually oh, wonder yeah. if the architecture, our architect between the two are the same, um, or if I there's some sort of connection. Right. Yeah, because they're very similar. I mean, shape, you know, roundness wise, and it's very industrial with the, you know, um, the, the, the support beams, the way that they're all looking with the round and. Um, cross beams Skidmore. and stuff. It's just very similar. But. Skidmore and, and, Owings. Yeah, so Skidmore Owing and Merrill is the one who did the station there. They mm -hmm. have tons of, our, of stuff, of buildings and things in Chicago. Um, I don't know who did the Oculus. That's not architecture. <laughs> no, and, and I know what, I know Santiago. What no, so that's Santiago Calatrava. Okay. The Oculus, which I should have known. And I, yeah. And, and I know what the, the structure you're talking about there in New it is York. Similar, it's, yeah. it's, it's been a couple of years since I've been to um, Manhattan and that, but uh, mm. I, I know what you're talking about. But it, but you're right. And now, now thinking about it, there are some similarities there just in terms of the, the shapes, the curve, the lines. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so my last question for you, for you before we wrap this up is if you can share one tip for photographers about a technique or equipment or something um related to what we talked about or something completely unrelated doesn't matter if you can share one juicy tip for everybody who's watching this we'd appreciate it okay um you know that the the, the one tip that i would point out to and again i'm kind of going back to my landscape photography i don't know if this is really huge tip in that. But um, I, I, again, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. You know, to me, go out with a pre-visualization of what you're intending to do. Because what goes along with that too is I will pay attention to the weather forecast and pay attention to, you know, what, you know, are there going to be clouds? Are there, you know, where, where are those clouds going to be and so forth and that. Go out there with a sort of pre-visualized thought of what it is that you want to come away with but then while you're there um try to get that shot but then also be open to looking around at your other surroundings um, be patient and look for where the light might be better than what you the, the, the than the location specifically that you went out there to try and shoot so um it kind of goes back to my point that i was bringing up, up earlier in that about patience and, and, and looking around for the, the best scene. It's not all the, the light's not always going to be best at the spot that you intend to go focus your camera, or put, you know, put the direction over on say this mountain or this lake or whatever and so forth. Too many times I've been out there and the light just happens to be okay over there, but wow, it's really hitting this other mountain so much better. There's clouds over there. Yeah. Um, so again, 
I guess the if there's a tip there, it's go out with an idea of what you want to get, but be very open to look around and look for the other scenes out there. Don't be locked into just the one thing that you thought you were going to go out for. Yeah. You know, if you have the time to actually map out and plan a landscape photo, mm -hmm. then using a tool like Photographer's Ephemeris or Photo Pills could come in really handy yeah. to to plan all that. If you don't have the plan or the time rather to mm -hmm. to do all that planning, then you do have to have the mindset that you might have to wing it and and readjust your entire plan uh, on the fly. Um, and that actually happened uh, when I was out in the Seattle Palouse area and. Mm -hmm. We were at this one location and we were expecting to photograph a certain direction and the sky was bland that at that exact moment when it was happening. But then everybody turned like 90 degrees and the sky was perfect. So everybody ran down the opposite <laughs> to the opposite direction to readjust real quick before the sun went down. Um, so you never know. Um, so it's a re that's a really good, uh, really good advice. Yeah. yeah. And, and you may go out expecting to shoot a lake at a beautiful sunrise and maybe there'll be a pair of bull elk that walk by on that. So right. there's, there's <laughs> always that something else that um, keep your eyes open and look for. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, Mike, for, uh, for, for joining us today and sharing your, uh, your work, sharing your, your, um, your thoughts and your knowledge about everything that you've been learning over the past many years. Um, we really appreciate it, and uh, we hope to speak to you again soon. Great, and and thank you again for uh, for hosting this and uh, for all of the great tips and so forth that uh, the community and you know Lori and, and Scott yourself and others provide. I, I, it's it, it's really been a great experience, and I look forward to it's a big thing about photography. There's always something more to learn, and I am looking forward to uh, continuing to work uh, that that direction. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you.